This is a special episode of the Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR 2023, Day 2. Hey everybody, this is Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Today, we're back with another special episode to discuss highlights from the ISSCR 2023 annual meeting taking place in Boston, Massachusetts. If you're at the meeting, make sure to drop by the Stem Cell Podcast booth in the exhibit hall to meet the team and learn how you could participate in a recording of the podcast in our on-site studio. Today, we'll be discussing some of the most interesting research we saw presented on day two of the meeting. So if you were in another session or weren't able to attend the meeting at all, we've got you covered. We're going to kick things off in just a minute. But before we get to that, looking to expand your knowledge or brush up on different techniques and protocols, Stem Cell Technologies offers a variety of free self-paced training courses on topics including culturing intestinal organoids, generating neural progenitor cells, and more. Sign up at www.stemcell.com slash on dash demand dash training to learn more. Yeah, let's go right into it and chat a little bit about day two here at ISCR 2023. Of course, we started bright and early in the morning with one of the concurrent track sessions or three of these kind of happening, of course, concurrently. I went to a few talks that were all over the place, a few that were in my area of interest. So apologies for focusing on what I'm interested in. You know, it's just a natural thing to do, going to things that you like to see. So I started off with Alessandro Bertero in the regeneration and disease modeling in a dish concurrent track this morning, focusing on cardiac organoids. Really a nice chat about chamber specific 3D organoids and how they can be used to uncover some of the mechanisms driving congenital heart disease. In particular, he was working on how certain transcription factors can regulate the expression of titan, which is, of course, the biggest protein in the body and a major contractile protein found in the heart. And again, using cardiac organoids to full extent to do this, and really a nice collaboration as well with Sasha Menjin's lab, who's developed a lot of these really nice early cardiac embryoid models for studying development. Moving to Michael Harridge's from the Cotton Lab over at Boston University, same session, uh, focusing on durable alveolar engraftment of pluripotent stem cell-derived lung tip-like cells into immunocompetent mice. It was a nice clinically relevant, it wasn't a, a translational or a clinically oriented talk per, per se, but it's an early cl- preclinical system evaluating the efficacy of transplanta- transplanting these cells into immunocompetent mice. And I shifted into the fully clinical side of things, uh, just down the road, down the door, uh, into the clinical applications track. And this was a lot of fun. There was a particular talk by Ludi Zhang from Shanghai, uh, focusing on the liver and understanding how iPSC, uh, actually not iPSC, these are directly reprogrammed uh, fibroblasts into eye hepatocytes, what they call them, high heps. Uh, these high heps were actually used in a post-hepatectomy liver failure model and actually it served as a bioartificial liver to support the liver after this uh, failure system. And it's not just a preclinical model. They use this bioreactor-based culture of these high HEP directly reprogrammed hepatocytes. And, and also those were thawed from cryopreservation in a, in a pig model and also in patients. They actually had some good survival after high HEP uh, transplantation into patients, cell therapy. They progressed the clinical trials and showed some restoration of, of liver function. This is a, a really emphasis of this particular morning session, there was a, a lot, actually a lot more clinical translation and IPS focused clinical trial work than I was expecting. There is a, a statistics, I forget who showed it, but there are currently 20 IPS FDA driven clinical trials that are actually occurring right now. And actually more, uh, there, there's uh, twice that number, uh, you know, 20 is for IPS and 10 is for human ESC. So it's actually a reflection that there's a lot more IPS clinical trial work that's happening right now instead of instead of ESCs. Taewon Kim focused on an in vivo CRISPR screen to identify P53, surprise, surprise, as one of the major axes that drives the survival of pluripotent stem cell-derived post-mitotic dopaminergic neurons during a transplantation model. This is a foundation, of course, for, for work from Blue Rock that Taewon Kim is from MSK. 
Uh, Blue Rock is, of course, focusing on treating Parkinson's using IPS-derived neuronal pre uh, cells. It's a strategy for perhaps improving the transplant and survival uh, of a particular graft and perhaps TNF-alpha inhibition using a Humira antibody, which is a really famous antibody, uh, can prevent the cell death during the transplantation of these iPSC-derived dopaminergic neurons. And one thing I thought was interesting was something you alluded to at the very end. Can that particular application, can that particular approach be applied to other cell types like cardiomyocytes as well? Next, I focused on, again, the iPSCs and clinical trials area, an intro, really nice intro from Debbie French, a nice overview of pluripotent stem cells in clinical trials. Like I mentioned, more than 20 iPS clinical trials are active now, twice as many as embryonic stem cell trials, which is kind of a reversal of what we saw about 10 years ago, right? And also, she was talking about some of her own really exciting work of creating these genetically customized iPS-derived red blood cells, potentially for transfusion purposes. This is a, a dream in the field, is to create these donor, uh, universal donor O-type bloodlines, blood cells, that you could use for transplant or transfusion purposes for, for anybody out there, right? O is the, the universal blood uh, type, and perhaps that would be an incredible advance to be able to derive these custom iPSCs from these custom blood cells from iPSCs and use them for any, anybody transplantation wise. Urger Aslan, I was really interested in this particular talk because it was a, a talk focusing on an area that I'm interested in, which is 3D iPS derived cardiac vasculature and incorporating two different three dimensional models into a single system. One is the cardiac spheroid, cardiac microtissue model, whatever you want to call it, emerging from Christine Mummery's group and implanting it into a microfluidic. Uh, dish, microfluidic chip, to see if you can actually facilitate the maturation of the, these cardiac spheroids. Some really neat uh, basic science work there. San, Jan Sokol uh, briefly ran into this talk in the single cell session, a different track, where this he's developing this Tesseract system. Nice name, kind of referring back to the, the, the Marvel series, right? You know, with uh, Thanos and, and all those guys, right? <laughs> Tesseract, yeah. So it's a new approach to explore single cell stem cell niches at a what's called four dimensional 4D resolution, incorporating time and the into the the aspect here. And really, I thought this was the bottom line here was multiplexing to the max in live cells. This is a big question: How much can you do in a single cell prep? And can you keep that cell prep alive after you do all of these ATAC single cell analyses to these cells? I think that's a really nice next step for live analyses. Um, and finally, looking at the uh, some of the standards, you know, I went over to the standard session, which is really headlined by Martin Para and Tanea Ludwig, friends of the show who have been on the show as well. They have really pioneered these standards documents for the ISCR, a critical document for basic science research, figuring out what are the right cell-based standards for creating custom cell lines, what should we do homogeneously and evenly across the board, no matter where you're deriving iPSCs, how should we characterize them, how much should we characterize them. One thing that came up in that conversation was, yeah, it'd be great to standardize, standardize IPS lines across the world, but how much is this going to cost? And how accessible is that standardization process to say new PIs like myself who may not have the most money to, to do these kind of standardization processes? So a fun conversation, not a hardcore science conversation per se, but I think it was definitely well attended and very relevant for the field. Yeah, you talk about standards. That's where I actually let off in my morning track. But first, I just want to say that I my strategy here was a stress test of this track, these concurrents, um, to see if you know it, it would work, if you could get the most out of this uh, meeting by jumping around between all these sessions. Uh, and I guess that was really governed by whether or not the speakers and moderators would keep everything on time, but also the proximity and the design uh, and the layout, right? So I, I decided to go to four successive talks in four different rooms. There were four concurrents going on. So I hit every room in my first four talks, starting with standards. I started uh, with Elisa uh, Mattioli from the UK, who was talking about establishing international standards for flow cytometry of mesenchymal stem cells. I mean, a pretty technical talk, you know, I don't think it, it I want to go too deep into it here in the, in the recap, but uh, just to say that this is a tough slog of a job, 
um, that may not really pique that much interest across the board, but I think is really critically important. And uh, I want to commend the, the hard work of the group doing this because it's going to drive translation in a safe way. And that's key and bring MSCs fully back. I mean, they're already creeping back, but bring them fully back from the brink of infamy where they're left with all those, uh, I'd say, bad actors using MSCs uh, for a profit. Um, after that, I went on to travel and merit award winner, Ru Chong Deng, uh, who's from the Stowers. And this was a really near and dear to me, the spatial transcriptomics and the fetal liver, um, looking at the niche in particular. Uh, and what I took away here, which was really cool, is a, a comparison, direct comparison of SlideSeq and Visium, which are two different methods for doing this spatial transcriptomics. And the takeaway there was that the SlideSeq had a better resolution with about 10 micron uh, coverage, whereas the Visium was about tenfold that at around 100 uh, microns when you consider the capture area and the space between beads. And indeed, the SlideSeq was able to identify single HSCs in a picture with a Visium, not so much. And, and the real uh, mechanistic or innovation, whatever, insight takeaway here was uh, they identified uh, NCADherin as a specific marker of mesenchymal stem cells that express niche, niche factors. Uh, and then took it to the next level, knocking out SDF1 in this NCAD Cree mouse, uh, showing that the hematopoietic stem cells don't localize to these MSCs anymore. Um, so that identifies a really unique and novel mesenchymal stem cell niche in the fetal liver, which may be important because the fetal liver, uh, although it's a bit controversial, owing to what we've discussed recently on the show, has been identified as a major site of hematopoietic stem cell expansion during embryogenesis. And this was a paper that was very mature and well-developed, probably in press. We can look for that and really dig down deeper uh, on the show when it comes out. Next, uh, I went to see Panagiotis uh, Duras from Blue Rock, who uh, was talking about the single off-the-shelf treatment for, oh boy, uh, mucopolysaccharidosis. I, I didn't say it right, but um, it's a, a rare lysosomal, lysosomal storage disorder. And I want to emphasize rare. It's a loss of function disease. And uh, what they did here is they were developing IPS drive mycoglia um, that could rescue, and this was the key, off the shelf. They could rescue cells in trance, okay? And they showed in co-culture uh, that they could uh, rescue the phenotype and they could enter the brain and persist long-term in mice and have a therapeutic benefit. So that was a great story for me because one, the whole off the shelf aspect, as you alluded to Arun, we're talking about a lot of clinical applications that are ready for trial. Um, and here, the third thing for me is this emphasis on rare disease. You know, it used to be you needed a threshold, you know, a certain amount of people dying or, or struggling with disease in the United States in order to justify funding all the work to do it, but not so much anymore. We're looking at these orphan diseases and coming with real approaches that, that could move the needle. So that's really exciting. Uh, finally, uh, for major talks, I went to another Merit Award winner from Lorenz's lab at MSK, Ryan Walsh, who's talking about his and other group members, a combined effort where they were looking at high levels of cortical organoid uh, organization, um, focusing really on the subventricular zone. And for me, the takeaway there, it, this is what it's all about. You know, from day one, we've been focusing on how we can create better models of human embryogenesis and what's more human than our brain, you know, it's what makes us tick uh, more than anything else and makes us different. So it's nice to see that we're approaching uh, these in vitro models that approximate uh, the anatomy uh, and therefore the, the biology of the human brain. And finally, uh, I don't know if this is new this year, but I went to this poster teaser session, which I thought was really cool, two minutes uh, per presenter. Um, and I love that they put it in the big room, you know, it was pretty, very well attended. Um, and hopefully draw some attention to the poster sessions, which are sadly, I would say, uh, underappreciated. Um, and also to mention that our guy, uh, Naveed Tavakal, who is a friend of the show and was on our Next Generation Scientist episode, that's number 180, if you want to have a, a listen. Uh, he gave a teaser, and it was great to see his career continue to take shape. Now he's modeling the complexity of the bone marrow niche uh, in Gordana's lab. You know, they do these uh, organs on a chip. So he's really moving forward at, at a, a fine pace. And it was nice to see his progression. That was the early morning uh, tracks and, and the late morning tracks. Uh, I started with um, 
Siwon uh, Wang, who was at Yale, who was looking at 3D genome regulation in disease. And that was really impressive talk in integrating molecular biology and ep epigenomics and nuclear chromatin architecture. A lot there, most of it over my head, but you could just see how um, these really, I guess, esoteric assays have really come to the, the fore over the course of decades and are now integral to every study and we're learning so much from. Next, uh, I had uh, Chen Wang, who's another Merit Award winner, he's from the Broad, uh, who was looking at cell identity and, and genealogy at the same time. And this was amazing because it was like looking at temporal dynamics. Um, usually you can look at you know, with barcoding, you could look at a uh, lineage and even in, in controlled systems like the mouse, you can look at it temporally, but not in a real live system like the human. So here they developed this uh, approach called redeem where they uh, use the mitochondrial genome as a natural barcode or, you know, there's this fundamental level of mitochondrial genome mutation. Um, and here, rather than this has been proposed before, but rather than looking, you know, more superficially with the data that's already in the seek, they did a deep mitochondrial mutation profiling, enriching specifically for the mitochondrial DNA, and that led to a 10x increase in the detection of mutations. And with that resolution, they were able, in human bone marrow samples that they took four months apart, they were able to do this kind of uh, genealogical, let's say, uh, lineage tracing, again, in a, in a living human system, um, and showed that there was a, a differentiation bias uh, in this native context. And uh, I think the real takeaway there, as uh, Chen mentioned, is that this is a system that can be applied in, in other cell sets, you know, so not just hematopoiesis, which is, is pretty accessible, but across the board and in uh, ES differentiation systems as well. Uh, next, I went to see Yifei uh, Mao, who is um, from Cincinnati Children's, uh, looking at this vascularized gut um, combining mesenchymal and endothelial cells and gut organized. And, you know, this was really impressive work, but I, I will just say as impressive as it is, I really appreciate the value of it in demonstrating the, the critical uh, contribution, the angiocrine <laughs> contribution, to quote uh, my former mentor and, and dear friend Shaheen Rafi. Um, but it really uh, underscored the angiocrine contribution but, you know, I'm waiting for someone to, when they talk about vascularize, I want to see perfusion. Um, and that that said, uh, you know, uh, Ife did show that when they transplanted in vivo, that there was a, a better uh, development of these organoids. But I just, you know, it's hard to distinguish whether that was perfusion benefit or the angiocrine benefit. So I, I know it's a big ask, but I, I'm really waiting. Maybe it'll be next year where we start to see some perfused organoids in vitro. I and mean, what an amazing uh, door that'll kick open for us. Um, then it was on to uh, Anna Smith uh, at BU, who was talking about uh, preconditioning um, for hepatocyte engraftment, where they induce uh, uh, P21 and native hepat hepatocytes to recapitulate disease, and that stops them proliferating. And then they transplant hepatocytes that have been treated with the uh, mod RNAs. And you can see now the mod RNA is still continuing to trickle into the, the, um, the landscape here. This In this case, encoding HGF and EGF, and they show that the graft is retained and, and reduces uh, disease burden. So um, a really nice outcome there uh, in this preconditioning story. Uh, next, there were a couple of stories uh, that I, I, or a couple of talks I caught um, back to back from Sheila Jacob at uh, Vita Therapeutics, and then um, also Corey Nichols who at Neurona Therapeutics. And I mean, putting aside the details, which I think were definitely very uh, strong talks, but what struck me was the difference in the approach here. Uh, Sheila Jacob was using this IPS-based paradigm. Um, that maybe some would consider a bit dated, considering that there were some kind of safety regs or, or complications there, and also just the burden of all the QC that you have to do for each patient line in order to get there. And that was contrasted by uh, Corey Nicholas at Neurona, who's used treating these drug-resistant epileptic seizures um, using this kind of off-the-shelf product, a central uh, IPS line with rigorous QC. And he shared data actually from two patients uh, that was very uh, encouraging and also a tremendous validation of CIRM support. You know, CIRM was supporting this work 
uh, back before it, it, it was, you know, in patients. And here we are with two patients showing really encouraging results. And finally, uh, we had a talk from uh, uh, Timothy Kiefer at UBC, which he recorded. He recorded and presented the talk, which is a fine presentation of the data. But I'll tell you, with all the the energy in the room here uh, at this at this conference, and I think with us, you know, COVID becoming a bit more of a memory, uh, the recorded talk it really took the air out of the room. Um, as as you know, much as there was there, I think that uh, you know, recorded talk should not be a thing that we carry through in in subsequent conferences. That's just my opinion, Arun. What did you think of uh, uh, the the tracks and and the next one after? Yeah, it was really a, a broad range of topics to cover here at ISSCR. I think that's one of the, perhaps one of the negatives of the meeting is that it's big enough where you just can't physically go to every single talk, right? There's There were situations where there were multiple talks just happening at the same time, and I had to make that clutch decision of which one to go to. You know, sadly, I had to pick one or the other. But yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the reality of a meeting like this. And one thing I did want to mention, you know, this is backtracking a little bit. Magdalena Zerginica Goats presented some interesting early human embryo modeling work from her day one, plenary one talk. And just at the very end of her talk, that was unpublished work. Um, you know, some very nice basic developmental studies. Unfortunately, and this I suppose this is what happens when you're working with uh, a technology of that caliber and that uh, that scrutiny, the media did pick up on this particular study and started running with it and said, oh man, you know, human embryos, synthetic human embryos are now being derived. And that's not really true. That's not the reality here. These are synthetic human embryo models. First and foremost, they're not being used for any transplantation in utero, in transplantation purposes at all. They are for studying early human development. So that's the sad reality of working in a charged area like that. I mean, again, and I've said this a million times, early human embryo modeling is the hottest subfield right now in stem cell biology. And there were some afternoon tracks that were focused on that particular area. Of course, you know, we were off to lunch briefly before we were chatting with some of the delegates, some of you all out there who are we're going to highlight in a future episode here on the Stem Cell Podcast, one of our future delegate episodes that we always like to do to get to know you all a little bit better, share where you're from, what you're working on. So again, if you want to stop by, the next time we're chatting with folks is in person. Uh, we have a meetup session pretty soon, and we also have another delegate recording session, I believe, that we're doing on Saturday. So plenty of time to highlight your work and your voice here on the Stem Cell Podcast. Moving on to the early afternoon after we finished chatting with some of the delegates, I actually went to the Stem Cell Reports meetup hub to chat up with some of the editors of the prestigious Stem Cell Reports journal, of course, the official journal of the ICCR, including uh, Christine Mummery, also um, uh, Martin Parra was there too, Yvonne Fisher, some of the editors of Stem Cell Reports. It's always nice to have a uh, connect face-to-face -face with some of the editors who are in charge of making some of those critical decisions about manuscripts, right? Never, never hurts. I actually briefly also had some coffee with a former trainee of mine, a, a stem cell biologist in her own right, Ryoko Hamaguchi here at Harvard. And that's what this part of this meeting is all about, is catching up with old friends, especially after the realities of the pandemic. So have a coffee, have a coffee or two, have a beer, catch up and say hey to your old, old pals. We're not just boxes on Zoom anymore. We're real people, real stem cell biologists, right? Moving on to the uh, concurrent tracks for the early afternoon, these were some cool tracks that we had to, I guess, cut short a little bit because we were chatting with some of the delegates here, but I'm mostly focused on some of the early human embryo modeling tracks. These were uh, really nice uh, um, uh, tracks that were focused on, again, in my mind, the, the hottest subfield of stem cell biology, you know, highlighting some talks such as uh, Eris Raz, the role of the RNA binding protein dead in uh, regulating primordial germ cell fate. Um, and this is, of course, chaired by Michinori Saitao himself, and you're, of course, very familiar with his work. Uh, other talks in this session were Jonathan DeRusso from UCLA looking at retroviruses and endogenous retroviruses and how they're regulated by this particular gene, TRIM28, 
And apparently these are critical for uh, primordial germs to, to license primordial germ cells for gametogenesis. It's, uh, again, very hot area of study, how you turn these iPSCs into primordial germ cells and ultimately into bona fide gametes. We're not quite there yet for the human side of things, but for the mouse, you know, we've definitely made quite a few strides. Uh, Moira Lawrence from Kyoto, a roadmap to the totipotent state in vitro. This is a really nice analysis of the, the various approaches and the various techniques and the just the, the, the analyses that you need to get to that ever elusive totipotent state. You know, a few people have described it, but I don't think we're quite there yet. And it was really nice to see a talk that dove deep into that area. And again, Yushin Lo from Peking University in China, again, focusing on totipotent cells to reconstruct mouse embryogenesis. Some really nice early developmental modeling. I also snuck into the new technology session where uh, Jörg Birdstar from Yale University was examining some amazing super resolution microscopy of single proteins in their nanoscale structural context. That was the name of the talk. It was mind blowing, you know, just the, the scale and the resolution that you can examine proteins often in live action these days, not just with fluorescent reporters, but going, you know, even beyond into that, into the individual confirmations and that sort of thing. Uh, really incredible resolution, ultra resolution imaging. And there are multiple talks focused on the area, including Jose Martinez uh, Sarmiento from UPenn. Again, super resolution imaging to uncover changes in chromatin dynamics. That's absolutely astounding to me. And just think about how far we've come in imaging over the last 10 years, where we're not looking at the cell and organelle or even, you know, Suborganelle level, we're looking at individual proteins at an incredibly high resolution in real time, thanks to these exceptional new imaging technologies that we've uncovered and developed over the years. So that was just a flavor of some of the things that I caught in the afternoon. You know, I, like I said, you couldn't catch everything because we were chatting with some of you, some of the delegates, and we're excited to highlight you on the on the show in the near future. Yeah, I like you. Uh, I was in a, a couple of the same sessions as you, Arun, and, and I was really uh, enthused, I would say, with our contact with the delegates. That was a great session. Looking forward to talking to a few more people on Saturday and tomorrow morning at the Meet Hub Hub. Um, although by the time you guys hear that, that'll already have been done. Hopefully, we would have chatted with a few of you. Uh, yeah, we didn't catch it all in that session because we had a little bit of overlap um, with our discussion with the delegates, but I also caught Maury Lawrence. That was great. Uh, Lorraine uh, Skurzik, who um, was from Wild Cornell, my home institute, she was talking about these novel germinal center B cells uh, that were more amenable to reprogramming. So, you know, totipotency, Maury was talking about pluripotency in these novel cells, although I will say uh, Lorraine had, had a, you know, uh, heroic, I would say, triumph over technical difficulties. There have been some problems getting the talks up here, um, but all credit to the organizers and technical staff. They have jumped to it and have kept things rolling relatively smoothly. Uh, yeah, again, Yushin Lao, I saw that talk too. Toti Potency and the assay actually in embryos is amazing. And finishing there with Mitsunori Saitu talking about the germ cell, right? You know, the the the, the most base cell of all. Um, so that was really exciting and him talking about some of his work in, in monkeys. I mean, the, answering the fundamental question, what are the signals from the gonadal somatic a compartment that actually dictate maturation of primordial germ cells into functional gametes? Uh, it's, a, it's a great outstanding question and one that Mitsunori and his, um, his spawn, I guess we'll say, he kind of like invented the whole field, uh, him and Azim Sarani, who worked closely together and uh, they've kind of cornered the market, him and his group and, and the people that have come out of his lab and established their own group like Hayashi et al. Um, after that, it was on to plenary three, Arun, which began with a little bit of a business meeting. Uh, it was 15 minutes where your boy, <laughs> Clive Svensson, uh, came up as treasurer and talked about the healthy finances of the ISSCR and some of the financial outlays in, in terms of, you know, child care. Uh, reducing the uh, membership fee for trainees, a lot of the financial um, measures that have been instituted in order to increase access uh, to the meeting. Also, Keith Alm, CEO, uh, who made a measure of the progress over 21 years, uh, thanking all the stakeholders and leadership, or leadership and outlining 
street strategic plan also uh, just fyi the the new leadership was listed we got amanda clark is the incoming president next year valentina greco vice president um clive svenson treasurer as well other offices have been filled then martin pair came up he talked about the state of the stem cell reports journal which is uh thriving and doing very well um has a, a really unique format that i'd like to highlight and that they bring highlight a paper from stem cell reports but bring on both the first and the senior author which i think is commendable and i would love to do that on, on our show uh, you know just to cop a, a strategy from stem cell reports i think it's a great idea um next getting to the talks uh ken zarrett uh came in with the you talk about you know the resolution the super microscopy going on here they're looking at sig signal single molecule resolution um in the context of, of reprogramming by tagging these individual nucleosomes um and you know trying to ask the question when during ips reprogramming is chromatin mobilized and it was a, a unexpected result that it happens really quick uh, that it happens within a couple of days and then there's a bit of a latency before you actually get a, a full uh, expression of pluripotent genes um then uh, gene lawrence came up from umass talking about nuclear compartmentalization um deep deep cell biology again arun uh, going back to what you said about the resolution we're subcellular here looking at um things that you know uh, that were beyond even imagination maybe uh decades ago then wolf reich came came up who's the founding director of altos labs he had a lot to say about how happy uh, everyone was there and, and doing half the experiments it's very entertaining he, he had such a a unique uh presentation style that i i for one appreciated i think the audience did too um and the question there was what governs the timing of epiblast development I, I thought it was such a great concept um and this used the transition from naive to primed uh pluripotent stem cells as a model and I think what was great there is he 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 threw out this principle for the for the stepwise transition that actually totally made sense to me and maybe explains how you can have uh, the different timing, the de developmental timing um, in different species. So that's something that surely is going to lay the foundation for a lot of work to come. And then finally, Yi Zhang, who who came out with this title, getting rid of defective hematopoietic stem cells to rescue age-related defects. And you know me, I love the blood. So I came in on this just as a baseline. I was going to come to this talk. I was waiting all day for it. Um, and it was great. You know, they found markers. I, I would say the major advance here, finding markers that define and distinguish old hematopoietic stem cells from young hematopoietic stem cells. CD150 specifically, a surface marker um, in the same animal, right? So you could distinguish the both and then showing by a lot of a, a series of experiments, very expensive over a long time and probably only do when you got that HHMI money at Harvard, um, but showing that these, these uh, CD150 low hematopoietic stem cells were effectively better uh, than the old. And if you, if you diminish the old, um, you would have a better outcome. The, the only way I think he yanked me a little bit with, is with this title, getting rid of defective HSCs. You know, we live in the age of the senolytics, you know, by getting rid of the senescent cells and even the fibrolytics. We've talked about using CAR-T to get rid of fibrosis uh, and to improve health span. Um, here, I was waiting for some kind of hemolytics, you know, an active means of destroying those old hematopoietic stem cells, but uh, didn't get there yet. But I mean, I'm sure it's on his plate uh, with CAR-T now and the surface marker 150, depending on how ubiquitous that marker is elsewhere in the body. I think maybe we have a means of specifically targeting these old HSCs, and then we won't have to parabiose ourselves to a young human, like the vampires that I, I, I hope I won't become, Arun. Um, maybe we can just target those old HSCs and live forever. That's the dream. That's the dream. But hey, Altos Labs, you know, Wolf Reek, like you mentioned, he has, uh, they have a different approach to this whole process of aging and, you know, perhaps incorporating reprogramming to reverse some of the aging phenotypes. He didn't really dive into what Altos Labs is really doing. It was, his was mostly just a, f a focus on the fundamental basic science that he's working on in his laboratory. But certainly that is the long-term approach of Altos Labs, and they've been throwing a lot of cash at it. That's that's for sure. And Ken Zarat and all of these talks were really emphasizing the importance of chromatin dynamics, and that was really the 
really the major focus of this section was, you know, epigenetic regulation of distinct cell states and all the different technologies and super resolution imaging and microscopy that you use to actually evaluate chromatin dynamics, either doing during reprogramming, during HSE maturation, a lot of different applications for chromatin and epigenetics. And part of it is, again, driven by the new technologies. ATAC-seq is so ubiquitous these days, all these other next generation single cell ATAC-seq and chromatin dynamics uh, evaluation approaches so it's getting easier than ever to evaluate you know that epigenome in your stem cells and it's such a critical aspect and perhaps not as much underappreciated anymore but traditionally was underappreciated of how important it is to maintain the stem cell state really phenomenal third plenary session and that's for now where we're going to wrap up for this day two recap of ISCR 2023. Of course, stay tuned for day three and for various other delegate chats that we were having with you over the course of the meeting. We can't wait to, to chat with you and see what you're up to. That's right. So that brings us to the end of day two of ISSCR 2023. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast. To find out what we're up to at the meeting and visit us at the Stem Cell Podcast booth on the exhibitor floor where you can win some prizes and find out how you could be featured on a future episode of the podcast. Check back here tomorrow for another episode recapping day three of the meeting. Uh, until then, thanks for listening.